Um, but today, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't already know. What I'm going to do is suggest to you how we can uh, make our explanations of issues like peak oil and climate change more concrete for audiences that don't have specialist knowledge. And so I'm just going to do a couple of demonstrations to suggest to you how we might do that. And let me start with peak oil. And we'll move on to climate change. Now, as Dave talked about, the rate issue is really the key issue. And I think of climate change and peak oil as essentially rate issues. So let's talk about uh, peak oil first. The rate at which we are using oil is so huge that we're going to reach a peak soon, if not already. And then those, those uh, supplies, that rate is going to start to decline. If we used oil at this very infinitesimal rate, we wouldn't be facing this problem. Uh, so it's the rate of discovery, the rate of extraction, um, the rate at which demand is climbing. Uh, those are all important rate issues. But I'm just going to focus on the rate of extraction. And you can see I have two cups here. And they are not cola and uncola. They are conventional oil with the C and unconventional oil. And in order to get a sense of what it's like to try and extract that kind of oil, remember what we're talking about when we look at Hubbard's curve is mostly the difficulty, and Dave alluded to this, the difficulty of getting the rest of the, the other half of oil that is available to us out. Now, do I have a volunteer who's going to help me extract this oil? And these are food grade products, so I'm not going to, there's no actual, okay, we have a volunteer back here. No actual crude oil in these. So let's try the conventional oil first. Let's see how we do on that. And, and easy, very easy to get. And how, how did that taste? It's like Coke. It's sort of sweet. OK, that's sweet crude. That's, that's, what, we, that's, what, that's what we run our society on now. OK, now we have the unconventional oil. Now, how is that? Had to work at that. Had to work at that. OK. And, and the taste? Uh, sour. A little sour. OK. That's the rest of the oil. A lot of it is sour. And that's because it has a lot of sulfur in it. Thank you so much. Let's have a hand for our <laughs> participant here. Now, there's, uh, we know now from experience that unconventional oil comes out at a much slower rate, and it's sour. Um, Incidentally, that's how oil used to be graded. People used to actually taste it. And the oil that had less sulfur in it tasted sweet to them. And we don't do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> now, you might say, well, that's easy. I have a solution to this slow problem, the slow extract. I can put more, more wells down <laughs> like this, and, and the horizontal ones that can move to the side. And we can just keep doing that until we get the same rate that we're getting out of conventional oil. Well, yeah, and that's what we're doing. We're building these huge new facilities in the tar sands and along the uh, Orinoco oil belt in Venezuela to do just that. But if you have more straws, we're going to need more people up here. And that means more energy just to get the energy that we need for the rest of society. You're going to have to have four or five of it here trying to work on one, one cup. And that means there's less, as Dave pointed out to us, less energy available to the rest of society. Um, now, maybe someone can suggest to me another way in which we could increase the flow of this unconventional sour oil. Well, we could put bigger straws in, but then that'd be more materials and we'd be more people. We could heat it, yes, except that's more energy. Right. We'd have to use, and typically we heat um, oil in the oil sands, and I, su I suggest to you that in the or or Ornarca oil belt, they're going to be using natural gas to heat it. So that's more energy in, less energy available to society. So that's um, one way that I think we can uh, relate these difficult rate ideas. Rate ideas are very hard to get across to people. In fact, there was a survey recently, and this had to do with global warming, um, asking people about these very rate issues. Because global warming is, are, you know, is a, a rate issue. Too much carbon dioxide, the rate of carbon dioxide that we're emitting 
is too great for the Earth to absorb. And so some of it stays in the atmosphere for long periods. People could not get this concept. It was very hard for them to get this concept. So I'm hoping to break through the rate barrier. Enough for oil now. Let's talk about climate change. Assume this is the atmosphere. And I've got a couple of markers for us on this atmosphere that I've concocted. And that is 450 parts per million, which a lot of scientists talk about as the absolute maximum that we can reach without having severe consequences. Now, not everyone agrees with that. James Hansen, who's probably the foremost uh, climate scientist in the world, says we need to get to 350. We need to get below 350. Does anybody know where we are today? Yeah, yeah, we're about 390. So we'd have to go down from there. Now, I've got one other notation on here. It says sink. That's the Earth absorbing uh, carbon dioxide from, from the atmosphere. The oceans do it also. There's the weathering of rocks. It's a very slow process. You notice that the opening here is very slow. So as we pour in our emissions of carbon dioxide, the outflow that is the absorption of the Earth, is actually quite small. And that's why it keeps building up. That's why the level keeps moving up, because we're pouring it faster than it is being absorbed. So a lot of people are under the mistaken impression that if we just stabilize the rate at which we're pouring, that everything will be fine. But of course, that's completely wrong. What will happen is that the concentration of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere will continue to go up if we just stabilize our emissions at the current rate. So what we have to do is back down on that rate. Anybody have any ideas about how much we need to back down on that rate? 90%. And there's actually some suggestions that we need to back down 110%, which would imply that we not only stop putting any carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but we start bailing out. And there are all sorts of geoengineering projects that have been proposed to actually extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. I'm not a fan of these because, of course, where are we going to get to the energy to do that? Well, most of the energy, in fact, 86% of the energy that we use uh, in the global economy today comes from fossil fuels. So are we going to use fossil fuels to run those <laughs> machines that extract energy or extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere? That would be kind of foolish. Those don't seem practical to me. So again, a very simple idea for how to talk about rates in ways that are concrete and also that relate to people's everyday experience. I think this is something that's been lacking in our discussions in the peak oil movement and the, in the uh, sustainability movement, um, and it's sorely needed. I don't suggest to you that these are the absolute best ways to talk about them, but they're two ways that I'm talking about them and hope to talk about them in the future. Maybe I'll refine this a little bit. Let me, do I have time for more? Oh, we're on time, right? OK. Um, I want to talk a little bit. You'll notice that the topic was risk. OK, I'm getting to the risk part. It was actually rate and risk. How do we illustrate risks to people and talk about their everyday experience of risk? How many people here have homeowner's insurance or renter's insurance? OK, a lot of you have it. And uh, normally, in policies like that, you're covered for fire. Now, how many of you have had a home fire for which you filed? And I know you've probably all had little fires, but for which you filed an insurance claim. We, we, this, is, this is an outlier. We have like three people who have who've filed an insurance claim. Typically what I get is no hands. Home fires that are damaging enough to file a claim are very rare. Very rare indeed. And yet we carry insurance for them. Why do we do that? We do that because the impact of a home fire can be very large, can be very severe. So we have a low probability event with high impact. And that's how people experience uh, risks every, in their everyday life. They take out insurance against low probability but high impact events. And they think nothing of it. Now, when you talk to them about climate change, when you talk to them about peak oil, for some reason, they don't put it in that frame. Let's talk about getting on an airliner. People have probably heard this illustration, but for those of you who haven't, I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, let's say you have a chance to go to your favorite uh, vacation destination, and you're informed that there's a 95% chance that your plane is actually going to make it to the destination. And of course, you want to know, well, what's the other 5%? 
Well, the other 5% is that it crashes. So how many people are going to get on that plane? I would submit to you that none of you are going to get on that plane because you think you have a better alternative. You, you'll get on a different flight. You'll go on a different airline. Um, and yet, if I were to frame that problem in terms of climate change or peak oil, if I said, well, there's a 5% chance that civilization will be destroyed by peak, by peak oil or by climate change, people say, well, that's a small you know, chance, and I don't really need to bother with that. So they are not framing these issues in the same way that they frame everyday risks in their lives. Uh, I'll give you one final example. Uh, if I could prove to you, beyond all doubt, that the stock market was going to go up nine out of the next 10 years, and you were convinced of this, you might quickly leave this room, call your broker, and go 100% in stocks, because Kurt just proved to me that I'm going to make all kinds of money over the next 10 years. Now, I've left out one piece of vital information. And that is, in the one year that it goes down, it's likely to go down 90%. Now, this is going to completely, you're not going to be rushing out to your broker after I say that. And this is going to completely change your calculation. And why is that? Because risk is really the product of probability times severity. That's actually how we judge risk. And if we can explain this to people, and relate it to their everyday experience, I think we can begin to get them to see that even if they think that a nearby peak in oil is a low probability event, even if they think that the possible consequences of, of, uh, of climate change, uh, of, ca of catastrophic climate change, even if they think that's a small probability, we can get them to see that we ought to take out some insurance, because that's what they do in their everyday life. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of the people in this room don't think that the consequences of climate change are going to be tiny. They probably think they're going to be quite severe, and that the probability that they're going to be quite severe is not small, but actually rather large. And I, I would submit that most of you think that the consequences of a peak in world oil production will also be quite large, and that the probability of it happening near, in the near term is actually quite a bit higher than, say, 5%. So, <laughs> but consider that your audience, they've never, if they've never heard this, or they've only vaguely heard about these ideas, they're not going to assess the probabilities the same that way that we do. So I think it's incumbent on, upon us to show them how even with small risks, even with risks that they regard as somewhat improbable or highly improbable, they are still willing to do quite a bit to ensure themselves against catastrophic consequences. That's it. Thank you.